And we're very um, happy this semester to start with a theme of points on elliptic curves. And if you go to the website, you can see the lineup of speakers we have uh, for this fall, at least the first half of the fall. And I hope that everything is uh, going well for you all in wherever you are. So today, I'm very happy to introduce Bjorn Poonen, who will be speaking about heuristics for the arithmetic of elliptic curves. Uh, Bjorn, do I have your permission to record this lecture? Yes, please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you everybody. So, I, so I'm gonna talk about uh, heuristics that try to predict whether the ranks of elliptic curves over Q are bounded or not. So let, me, so let me start by saying that what I'm gonna talk about is joint work with a lot of people in a, in a lot of papers. So I've listed all the authors here, some of which, some of some whom were in multiple, multiple papers. Um, yeah, all right, let me get started. So, so an elliptic curve over Q is, is, is given by an equation like this, except strictly speaking, it's supposed to be a projective curve. So you take this affine curve in the plane, and you take its closure in P2. And in order for it to be an elliptic curve, it, it needs to be a smooth curve, which means, which amounts to saying that the discriminant of this polynomial should be, should be non-zero. And the, if you calculate the discriminant with some constant times this, so, so yeah. Okay, anyway, so it's essentially, a, a, it's a cubic curve that's given by an equation like this, where these coefficients are rational numbers. Okay, who cares? So, I mean, why, why should you care about these curves at all? So, yeah, who cares? Well, I care because, first of all, they're, they're the simplest varieties. I mean, from the point of view number of theory, they're the simplest varieties whose rational points are not fully understood. So rational point just means uh, a pair of rational numbers, x and y, that satisfy the equation. And all together with the point of infinity. And, on, and also, they're the, these are the simplest examples of algebraic groups, of projective algebraic groups of positive dimension. And so they're, they're really like the first testing ground, the first testing ground where I think interesting things start happening. All right. And it's be, because it, ha, it has, a, it's a group variety because it, it's an algebraic group. It, the, rash, the rational points also form a an, uh, group and, and it's a, uh, and the, the group law is, is, is commutative. So you get an abelian group. Okay. So, all right, and, and it's an old theorem of Mordell, as I mean, conjectured even earlier, um, that this, this abelian group is always finally generated. So, it's a, okay, so Mordell proved that in 1922, and, and if you, well, you know the structure theorem for, for finally generated abelian groups, so it must be of this form. It'll have the uh, direct sum of the uh, power of the z, and then mm -hmm. finite abelian group. And, um, okay, so, and this finite abelian group, that's called the torsion subgroup. And Mazur uh, worked out all the possibilities for this group. So he proved that the only possibilities are these, uh, I guess, fifth, yeah, 15 groups. So they're, it could, it's either cyclic of order up to 12 and not, not, not Z mod 11Z, or else it's, it's almost cyclic. It's got, uh, a, a, it's got an extra factor of Z mod 2Z across the even cyclic group. And then there, yeah. So, okay, so, so there's no mystery. I mean, it's pretty easy if somebody gives you an elliptic curve to figure out what the torsion subgroup is. So there, but the mystery is what, what, what is the rank? I mean, in fact, it's not even known whether there's an algorithm to compute the rank in general, but well, you can still ask questions about it. What, what for example, okay, so what, what can you say about that rank? And uh, so this, is actually, this question actually goes back even before it was proved that that the group was finally generated, so even, even before it was known that the rank made sense. So Poincaré asked in 1901, what, he essentially asked, what are, what are the possibilities? What are the possible values for this rank? And in, in particular, as part of this question, you can ask implicit in this is the question of whether the rank is uniformly bounded, so bounded as you vary the elliptic curve. And a lot of people have thought about this question. So, Initially, it seemed that people thought the answer would be yes. So, you know, in 1950, wrote, he th thought probably, probably it's yes. And Honda also made a conjecture along those lines. And then, then Castle's 
said, oh, I think you're all, all these earlier authors are wrong. You know, I, I believe it's actually unbounded. And, and then, I, I don't know, I'm not sure if these are, if these, all these people were sort of independently thinking about this or if they just said, oh, well, if Castle said it, it must be true. So, all right, but anyway, so they all, everybody started saying, oh, probably it's a, it's a folklore conjecture that it's unbounded and so on and so on. I mean, I think some of these people actually did have, have other good reasons to believe it was unbounded. I mean, there were some other, there were some reasons. I mean, people started using computers to investigate the question. They started finding elliptic curves of higher and higher rank. And like every, every year, it seemed that there would be a new, new record for the, and so it, it seemed to be going up. And also it was, it was shown in the function field case that the, the rank could be, uh, could be arbitrarily large. So on the other hand, um, more recently, a couple of a couple of authors had um, not just guesses, but they actually had some heuristic reasons for believing that that the rank should be bounded. So um, so yeah, so so Ruben Silver, Silverberg had some argument based on um, on lattices, and they actually and they actually had an argument that suggested in a, in a in a family of quadratic twists, the rank should be bounded by eight. Um, but if they didn't really believe themselves because, I mean, there are, because they knew that, that the rank is actually not bounded by eight. So, I mean, whatever their heuristic was, it, I mean, there, at least there's something, there's something fishy about it. But uh, Granville had a different heuristic based on counting integral solutions to polynomial equations that, that, yeah, and, and he, well, he originally did it for quadratic twists, a family of quadratic twists too. Um, and then Watkins uh, adapted his arg Granville's argument to the family of all elliptic curves. And yeah, and yeah, and they got an upper bound, they said they got an upper bound of 21. And what I'm gonna do in this talk is present a, a different heuristic, which, which tries to not just, I mean, it, not just study ranks in isolation, but actually, Try to study a complete package where you look at ranks and all sorts of all sorts of other things, all sorts of other invariants attached to an elliptic curve. And the idea is maybe you can pack, you can you can find a simple model that that um, yeah that, that 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 predicts everything together. And if you if you're predicting many things at once, then you can try to corroborate it with with uh, theorems about the various pieces. And so you have more ways to check it. And so you can get more confidence, maybe, that these predictions are correct. And mysteriously, it turns out that our heuristic also leads to leads to a prediction of 21 as as an upper bound. Well, not a not a strict upper bound, but I mean, in fact, there are some elliptic curves known that have rank greater than 21. But the the prediction that comes out of these this heuristic is that the rank is that there are only finitely many elliptic curves that exceed this bound of 21. Okay, so now I should be a little bit careful about what I mean by when I say for all but finally many E, because if you just look at the equations, each elliptic curve up to isomorphism appears infinitely often, because you, you can always do a change of variable on your equation and get something that, that's really just the same elliptic curve. So in order to take that into account, let me mention that you can always put this elliptic, the equation of elliptic curve in some sort of canonical form where you scale the variables in an appropriate way to, to make it so that the rational numbers A and B are actually integers. And, and you can also just scale it exactly just, just right to get rid of any extraneous factors in, 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 the, in these integers A and B. So whenever you have a prime such that P of the fourth divides A and P of the sixth divides B, you can do a change of variables to to eliminate it. I mean, it's kind of like taking the, a GCD or something. But so, and then once, okay, but once you take care of that, then it turns out that there's a, then you get a unique representative for each isomorphism, for each isomorphism class. And so I'm gonna let this, this, this fancy E be the set of all these representatives. So now, so this is a set where each elliptic curve up to isomorphism appear, appears only once. And so now when I, whenever I say something like all but finally many E, what I really mean is I'm only looking at these representatives and I mean for all but finally many of these, of those elliptic curves. 
And the other nice thing about putting an elliptic curve in sort of this insert in, into this sort of simplest form is that you can define some notion of height, which measures the complexity of this elliptic curve. And so it's just something that's based on the size of the coefficients, A and B. And, and because the discriminant is, is, is some combination of these quantities, 4A cubed and 27B squared, um, you can, so see, so it, it's, it's sort of, well, sort of natural to define the height this way. This is some sort of naive height. I mean, there's some more sophisticated versions of this, but this is going to be sufficient for what we're trying to do. And it's more or less the same as, as other heights. So, okay, so, um, right. So, so then you can look at, um, if, you want, if you want to sort of order these elliptic curves, you can order them by height, which, and so what that means is you'll look at, for any given value of H, you can look at all the elliptic curves of height less or equal to that. And that will be some finite set because once you bound H, you're, you're giving an upper bound on these integers, A and B. And you can actually count how many, how, how finite it is. So you can, and because if, I mean, once you fix H, then if, if, if these two numbers are supposed to be bounded by H, that means A can go up to something around H to the one third and B can go up to something around H to the one half. And well, you can't just choose any integers up to that range because there's this condition, but you, you can check that when you sieve out the, a, the pairs A and B that violate this, then you, you're only sieving out a positive fraction, of the, some fraction between zero and one. So you still end up with the same, uh, roughly the same number. So you up, if you ignore these constants, then you find that they're H to the five sixth. So uh, elliptic curves of that height. Okay, so remember, remember this five six for later. All right, so um, now let me talk about, so I mentioned, I, going back, okay, so going back two slides. So I mentioned that we're, we're gonna model not just ranks, because that's hard to do just by, by themselves, but we're gonna model it together with these other invariants. So I, I wanna tell you a little bit about what these other things are. At least I'll tell you what a summer group is. So, all right, so. Okay, so this you have to know, in order to understand this definition, you have to know a little bit about Galois cohomology. So what you, you do is, okay, so fix an integer, n, at least two, and then we, what we're gonna try to do is, get, is to figure out what the rank of E is by looking at this quotient. Because if E, if E of Q, for example, looks like Z cubed, then this quotient should have a copy of Z mod NZ cubed in it. And yeah, so, and so you can, so if you can bound this group, then you can also bound the rank. And so, so the question is, which elliptic, so to what extent can you take a rational point and divide it by two? So what's the obstruction to dividing a, a rational point by two? And okay, so if, if you're trying to divide a, 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 a point over Q bar, instead of over Q, if you're trying to divide a Q bar point by two, you'd always be able to do it because you can, Geometrically, the multiplication by n map, or I guess I was saying two, but the multiplication by n map is surjective on, on geometric points, on q bar points. And so you can always divide it. So this is, you have a surjective map here and you can define the kernel to be this. And, but now we wanna look at what, if you actually start with a rational point, can you, can you find, can you divide it and get a rational point? And then there's gonna be an obstruction coming in, in Gallup homology. So you, to see it, you take Gallup homology of this, of this sequence, and you get a long exact sequence coming out, where here, you, the first three terms are just the Gallup invariants of these things. So by Gallup theory, you just get the rational n torsion points, you get E of Q going to E of Q. And then the next term is the H1 of this group, which I've written here. And so, and okay, and then it keeps going. And if you want to, so you get a long exact sequence, but you can, you can cut it off at this point by, by replacing this group here by the co-kernel of this map, which I've, which I've written here. So if you do that, then you get this, well, you get the beginning of, a of an exact sequence that has the group that we're interested in, and then that embeds into this cohomology group. And remember, we're trying to prove that this group is finite, to, or we're trying to bound this in order to bound the rank. So wouldn't it be nice if this were just some finite group and then we would, and then you could, maybe you could figure out the size of this thing and then that would give you a bound on the rank. But unfortunately, uh, this group is always infinite. So it's, it's not very helpful by itself. 
okay, well, I mean, it's infinite, but maybe, I mean, this, we, I mean, this thing is eventually supposed to be finite. Maybe you can figure out what the image of this map is, with this, this sort of global co-boundary map. And so if you can, if you can bound the image of this, maybe, maybe that, that'll give you a bound in the rank. So, okay, so, so we can try to figure out what's the image of this map. But that, that's really, that, that problem is, is, is a, that's a hard problem in general. I mean, things over Q and number fields, those tend to be hard questions. So instead, we can look at a, a, a corresponding local question. I mean, because there's nothing in this, in the formation of this, of this sequence, there's nothing special really about Q. You could do this for, for other, other fields, at least other fields where the characteristic does not divide in. So in particular, you could do this for, a, for, the, for the field of piadic numbers and you'll get a corresponding local sequence. And it's much easier to figure out what the image of a sequence like this is. It's much easier to understand the QP points on E because you can use tools like Hensel's lemma to understand that. And so, yeah, so, so, so you, you, can, you can really compute this image of this map. And more, yeah, moreover, this, this thing here turns out to be finite. So it's actually quite easy um, to figure out what this image is for any given prime P. And in fact, you can even do this for all primes uh, together. You can, so you can figure out, you can figure out sort of the, the, you can take the product over all primes, including the infinite prime, which by which I mean you QP is the real numbers. And so you can find, you can essentially determine what this local, you can, you have, you have a good understanding of what this, what this image is here. So here's the idea now. So we want to know here, in this group, what are the things that actually are in the global image? But that's too hard to test. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at this map and we're going to ask, okay, we can't test whether it's globally in the image, but let's check whether it's come, when, when, when you map down here, is it, is it locally in the image? And so that, that, so you get you, that gives you a condition because, because of the commutativity of this diagram. And so you can define the summer group, the end summer group, to be a subgroup of this group. Those are the ones, they're the classes C belong here, such that when you map them down, they're in the image of this local map. And th that's necessary in order for that C to have a chance of coming from here. So, okay, so, um, all right. So, so, this, so, so this group, that these are the classes, maybe they're not in the global image, but they at least satisfy this weaker condition of being in the local image. So that, that's going to be an upper bound for the global image. So it's an upper bound for this, for the, the, for this group here. Okay. And, and not only that, it turns out that because, because these local conditions are so easy to understand, you can actually compute this group. There's actually an algorithm to compute this group for, in, in principle for any, for any elliptic curve and any n. And, and, it, it, and it turns out to be a finite group as well. So if you, once you prove this is a finite group, that, that proves that this is finite. And that's how you can get an upper bound in the rank. So, okay, so, all right, so let's, and okay, so just, so now the question is, well, how good an upper bound is it? So, I mean, so you, it turns out that by studying this sequence, okay, let me go back one slide again. So by studying this and by looking at the next term in this, in these long exact sequence, in these long exact sequences, you can get it, you can measure the error you can measure how good an upper bound this is by com comparing it to what it, what, what, how, how different this is from the actual, from the actual group it's trying to bound. And yeah, by the way, there's some people like to define the summer group as being, instead of doing it this square, they like to define as the kernel of some diagonal map. I, I never liked that very much because I don't know. I'm like, why, why look at, why look at that diagonal map? I and mean, what's the motivation for this? I find, I somehow I find this sort of, this kind of story more, more compelling. So I, I always like to define some of it this way. Okay. Anyway, so, um, yeah, so, all right. So, and so the difference between the group we were trying to bound and then the summer group, the difference is measured by the end torsion of, of some other group that's defined. I, I maybe I won't define, define it here, but some other group defined using cohomology that comes from, also comes from the exact sequence in the, the, the sequences on the, the diagrams on the previous page. Okay, so, and so, th so this, as, and as I said before, this group here is finite and computable. So if you, if you were able to figure out which of these elements 
map to zero here, then you would, you would know what this group was here. Uh, unfortunately, that seems, that seems to be a hard question. Nobody knows how to do that in general, but um, yeah. But, and and what you, another thing you can do is you can do this not just for one n. I mean, maybe it's hard to do it for one n, but maybe you can combine the information for many n. And um, if you do it for n that's a product of prime powers, then it sort of, this sort of all breaks down into, you can use Chinese remainder theorem and break it down into prime power cases. So you might as well take n to be a prime power. And then um, you can, in fact, you can do it not just for one prime power, but you can take a, a direct limit of, of, of all these groups as, as, you, as you, you start increasing the power. And you get more and more refined information as you increase the exponent. And so you might hope, oh, maybe if you take the limit, then you'll get precise information. And so, yeah, so you can do this and you get these. So here, if you, if you rewrite this as like Q, E of Q and then tensored with one over N Z mod Z, then when you take the direct limit and what was N being used powers, you get E of Q tensored with this group. And then, yeah, so I mean, this, with this group here, what it looks like is it's a power of Q P mod Z P. It's a finite, it's a finite power of QP mod ZP, and um, and these these other groups, oh, they're also dependent, they're also similar. They're going to be what are groups of that are called uh, ZP modules of cofinite type. So they look, I mean, they their Pontryagin duals look like our finitely generated ZP modules. So they they all have the, the structure like a finite group direct sum, a finite power of QP mod ZP. And then the only question is how many copies of QP mod ZP are there in there? Because that's going to be the rank. And, and so, well, and so conjecturally, actually this has, this group here is finite. So this group is supposed to have zero copies of QP mod ZP. And so if you could count the number of copies of QP mod ZP here, that should be the sharp answer. That should be what this, what the rank is. So yeah, so, so we'd like to actually understand how, what all these things look like. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna start varying the elliptic curve and see how does, what does this look like? What's, what, if, you, if you choose random elliptic curves or you look at all the elliptic curves up to height h, how, what's the distribution of, of, these, of these groups here? As well as the individual summer groups. Okay, so, all right. So, I mean, the, the general principle here uh, that, well, that was guiding, well, guiding us is that if, for example, suppose you just look at the P summer group for one prime P. So then we know that that's a finite group. And so if you, so, but it varies as you vary the elliptic curve E. So you get, you get a, you get a collection of finite groups. Now, what, what do you think the distribution of that in fact is, it's not just a finite group. It's a, it's a fine, it's an FP vector space. This, the P summer group is just an FP vector space. So what do you expect the distribution of a fine dimensional vector space to be? And well, we don't know, but there were some theorems in the literature about what happens for P equals two. And there's a theorem of Heath Brown from the 1990s that, that had a prediction for what the distribution of the dimension of that F2 vector space should be. And so, so Eric Raines and I looked at that and we, we said, Okay, come on. There can't be that many ways of generating a random F, F2 vector space. I mean, it's probably just comes from some random linear algebra construction. Like you choose, like you choose n generators and you mod up by some number of relations and something like that. So we just tried all kinds of, all kinds of linear algebra constructions. And eventually we came upon uh, this conjecture. So let me explain what this conjecture is. We found, we found a particular linear algebra, algebra construction that produced a distribution that matched what Heath Brown had discovered. So just by matching the formula. I mean, we didn't have, at that point, we didn't have any idea why this construction worked. Okay, let me, anyway, I've been talking too much. Let me, let me actually tell you what, show you what this model, what this linear algebra construction is. So you start with a vector space, a big vector space, so n is gonna be large, an FP vector space of dimension two n, and, but not just a vector space, I wanna make it a quadratic space, which means it's a vector space equipped with a, a, a quadratic form. So it's a, a homogeneous polynomial of degree two that, that, that exists on this vector space. So it's a, it's a quadratic form and two n variables. And 
And this is the simplest non-degenerate quadratic form there is, which is just this, it's called the hyperbolic quadratic form, where you just take the sum of the sum of the products of the, it's like kind of like a, yeah, it's kind of like a dot product, except I'm viewing as a function of one argument, one, one vector of length 2n. Okay, so anyway, so that's a quadratic form. And then you can define a notion of, you can call a subspace maximal isotropic if, first of all, so isotropic means that the quadratic form is zero everywhere on it. And then maximal means that it should, among the ones where, where, where the quadratic form is zero, it should be of maximal dimension, which is equivalent also to saying that it's per, the, the set of, the set of uh, vectors that are perpendicular to, to all to that subspace under the associated bilinear pairing that should just be exactly the the vector space it's, itself. I mean, normally the this this perp has the complementary dimension inside this two n dimensional vector space. So this this actually in the presence of this condition, this is really just, just the same thing as saying that z is of dimension n inside this. It's an n. It's sort of a half dimensional vector. It's a dimension whose it's a sorry it's a vector space whose whose dimension is half the, the the dimension of the of the whole space. Okay, so so that's a that's a maximal isotropic subspace, and well, I mean everything's here is finite because we're we're we have a fixed n and we have a fixed prime p, and so there are only going to be finitely many spaces altogether. So there are only finitely many of these z's. Okay, so here's what you do. You take two of them. You take two maximal isotropic subspaces, Z and W, and you intersect them. Now this intersect, so I'm intersecting two n-dimensional subspaces in a, in a two n-dimensional space. So the intersection could be zero. And it, well, it could be anything from zero up to n, I guess. And you, but you, you take the dimension of that intersection. And if the Z and W are random, then you'll get some random um, you'll get some random variable. You'll get some, this dimension will be some random variable. And you can look at what happens to this random variable, what its distribution is on the non-negative integers. As you, in the limit where the ambient space becomes larger and larger. And it turns out that the, the limit exists. So there's gonna be a certain probability. If you look at the probability, for example, that this dimension is zero, that tends to a limit as n goes to infinity. And same for the probability that this dimension equals one, and so on. And so then, so you get a so you get a distribution that, that now is supported on all non-negative integers. It somehow decays rapidly as as as. And then the conjecture that we made is that that is what the that is what the p summer group of an elliptic curve looks like. The dimension of that, as you vary the elliptic curve among all elliptic curves over q, it it behaves like this 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 linear algebra construction. And now, at this point, there are lots of reasons to believe this conjecture. So first of all, the original, well, this is kind of where it came from, is this, this result of Heath Brown that said that this, this is actually the correct answer, at least, well, maybe not if you look at a, the family of all elliptic curves, but if you look at the, if you restrict to a family of quadratic, certain quadratic twist families, then you get, you get exactly this, what you mean, at least for p equals two. In fact, but the, I mean, to say that that's evidence for this conjecture is kind of cheating because we, because we use this, because we modeled our, I mean, we came upon this conjecture by using, by starting with what Heath Brown's theorem was and said, oh, what, what, what linear algebra construction could get this? Oh, look, and it now it's compatible with that. Big surprise. All right. So, yeah, and, and yeah, so and a bunch of other people have worked on on and extending Heath Brown's method to other families of quadratic twists. And so okay, so yeah, so there's that evidence. Oh, also, sure. I mean, after we found this linear algebra construction, we actually proved that the summer group actually is an intersection of two maximal isotropic subgroups. So there's something you can define in the arithmetic of an elliptic curve where you can actually see some isotropic subgroups showing up. I mean, it turns out that they're actually maximal isotropic subgroups in an infinite dimensional vector space, so which you, you equip with some, 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 some topology to make it some locally compact, uh, some locally compact uh, FP vector space. But anyway, but I mean, that, that actually, that also kind of fit, fits with this, because I mean, if it's, happen, if it's really the intersection of, an infinite, of two infinite dimensional vector spaces, then it makes sense that you should get the right answer when you let n go to infinity here. So, 
Up yours? Yeah, so. There's a question from Allison Miller about just whether there's a simple explanation for why the distribution converges to a limit as n goes to infinity. Oh, that, that's a good question. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if there's a simple explanation. I mean, we sort of, I mean, what we did, we sort of calculated it and, and just checked that it did. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if there's a simple explanation. I mean, there is some relationship between the, the situation when you take n and you take n plus one. There's, there's a way to go from a quadratic space to a, a, to a, to a smaller one. So if you have a, you have a quadratic space and you choose an, a one-dimensional isotropic space, subspace, let's call it x, then you can take x perp, which is of dimension 2n minus 1, you can take x perp mod x, and then that gives you, uh, if, if you start with a non-degenerate quadratic space, you'll get a x perp mod x will be another quadratic, non-degenerate quadratic space. So you can do some comparisons, things like this, and to, to, to match up but I, th but I think the way, yeah, if my memory is the way we did it, was just by checking, by just actually figuring out what the distribution was and just checking that it converged to a limit. Okay, thanks. So, sorry, were there other questions here? So there's a, okay. Oh, okay, it's, it's a question for the future. All right, so <laughs> from plugging up to Fuzzy Okay, your, your time will come, so. All right, so, all right, so, all right, so those are two reasons, to, well, one cheating reason and one actual reason to believe this. And also uh, another reason that this is, this, this conjecture is compatible. Well, I mean, there's not, there's not a general theorem about this yet, but it's compatible with some consequences of this theorem. So if you knew this complete distribution, you would in particular be able to predict what the average size of the, of the, of the summer group was. And, and, as far as we know, that's compatible. I mean, that's compatible to all the theorems that have been proved. So first there was Johan de Jong proved a, a result in the function field case for the three summer group, for the, the, for the average side number of elements in, this, in the three summer group in, for, for a global function field. And then Bhargava and Shankar proved a series of results for, for elliptic curves over Q for the two summer group, the three summer group, and and four, four sum of group and five sum of group. And in all cases, this is compatible. Well, I guess maybe not for four because P is four is not a prime, but anyway, but as, at least for as much as it's compatible, as it, it's as compatible as it could be with this. There, there's nothing, nothing, everything looks right. And recently there's, there's some further evidence for this. If, there's, if you take the function field version, um, but then, and then you take what's called like a large Q limit version of it, where you, it's, it's not quite where you, yeah, anyway, you, 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 you bound the height first and then you let the Q go to infinity. And then you, you, you try to look at the distribution of these things. And that, that is actually, the, uh, then it's proved that this, this distribution is correct for that, for that variant of the problem. Okay, so you have all, so, okay, so I hope you believe this conjecture. So, I mean, if you, if, well, if you don't believe this, you're definitely not gonna believe what I tell you later, so. Uh, all right, so, um, so now um, I and a bunch of my co-authors that were listed on the first slide, we tried to extend this. So we had this model for this P summer group, but now we want to understand, we want to adapt it to get a model for the, the higher summer groups, for the P of the E summer group. And then if you can do that for all E, you can put them together and take a direct limit and hopefully get a model for the distribution of the P of the infinity summer group which gives you more refined information and maybe gives you more information about the rank. So, and so we, so we succeeded in doing that. We just, we just guessed, well, based on, well, after a couple of false starts, we sort of guessed what the, what the conject, what, what a reasonable conjecture could be of some linear algebra construction that would give a distribution that is likely to be the distribution of the P of the E summer group. And then we actually put it all together to make a, just a conjecture for the P of the infinity sum group. And in fact, we tried to, we, we, found a, uh, we found a simple model that would not just predict that, but also predict all the terms in the sequence. So, so we have, a, so we have, so we, we found a simple linear algebra construction that would, so where you just choose some random matrices over ZP and you do some co-kernels and kernels and so on. And, and you get a, a you get a, a random sequence of ZP modules 
And we, we conjecture that that should be, that distribution of that should be the distribution of what comes from elliptic curves. And so in particular from this, well, even, even more, you can, actually, you can actually look at the distribution of this shot, of this, of this, fine, of this Sheffrey-Rich cake group, and the it looks like you get a different distribution for each if you condition on the rank of the elliptic curve. I mean, it's almost as if, I mean, people who've studied the Sheffrey-Rich cake group know this, but it's almost as if the Sheffrey-Rich cake group is a different group for each value of the rank. And so each, for each value of the rank, it has its own distribution, this p primary part, this p, p power torsion in this group. And yeah, so we, we predicted a distribution for what that should be. Um, you might ask, well, maybe that doesn't make any sense. I mean, what is it? Suppose R is 100. Maybe there aren't any rank 100 cur elliptic curves in this, in this set. And then what does it mean to talk about the distribution? And well, I don't have a good answer to that, but don't worry about it. So, yeah, and what this just, what this, so there's some linear algebra construction that gives you this. And, and, and it amounts to taking a random matrix over ZP with respect to har, har measure that's alternating, which means that it's equal to the negative of its transpose. So it's like a skew symmetric matrix. That's what this little alt means. So that, that's, so, okay, so you can choose a matrix in there at random, and then you can look at its co-kernel as viewed as a map from ZP to the N to ZP to the N, just as a you know, linear transformation of, the, of ZP modules. And well, ZP is not a field, so the co the co kernel is a, well, it's a ZP module, but it could have a torsion subgroup. And so you take the torsion subgroup of that, and that gives you some finite finite VLMP group, and we conjecture that the distribution of that is the distribution of this P infinity torsion here. And oh, I I, I so I forgot to say one thing. So we don't just take any matrix, any random matrix in here. But if you want the distribution of this for rank R elliptic curves, then you should, you should take the A's in here such that the rank of the kernel is R. Okay, and there, there, again, there are many reasons to believe all these conjectures on this page. So first of all, there are some prior conjectures by Christophe Delaunay and, and Juhay uh, over the, so starting in 2000, that, that made predictions about some sort of Cohen-Lenstra heuristic kind of things for adapted to predicting the distribution of these groups. And our, our, our conjecture matches theirs in, 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 in the cases where they, where they both apply. And also uh, recently there's, um, so Alex Smith proved a version, well, he proved that this distribution is correct for p equals two, well, not for the family of all elliptic curves, but for for many for many families of quadratic twists. Okay, so I hope you all believe this. Um, oh, so the question is, what is n? I guess you're talking about this n here. Yeah, sorry. I, I so n is yeah n is going to be it's it's yeah it's similar to what happened on the previous slide. You're supposed to take this distribution for each n. And then you take you let n go to infinity, and you actually have to let n go to infinity through integers of of, of a parity, depending on what this r is. But yeah, so but just otherwise you get you this this code yeah to get to to in order to have a yeah. But anyway, so yeah, you, that's what that's that n n is going to always go to infinity at at some point. Okay, so. All right, so now let me, okay, so sorry, let me, let me now go to the, I mean, oh, so yeah, so let me, let me just, I wanna focus on this one thing here. So you notice that we are modeling the, these groups for each, for each value of the rank. And the rank comes in, in this way, the rank, so we condition to, to get this distribution for the rank R elliptic curves, we condition on this, on the rank of this kernel being R. And, but now you can sort of turn things around. Suppose you want to, you don't want to condition on the rank. You don't want to condition on, you don't want to fix tension to rank on our elliptic curves. Suppose instead you want to look at all elliptic curves and figure out what, what's the distribution of the rank. 
So you can, you can turn around and say, okay, so then maybe you're supposed to just choose A at random and just see what kind of ranks of these kernels comes out. And, and maybe that should be the distribution of the ranks. And I mean, that would be the simplest possible explanation for why it's, why it's showing up this way in, in, this, in, this, in, this theory, in, this, in these conjectures. And well, I mean, it, you don't necessarily want to do this for p-adic matrices, because if you do it for p-adic matrices, then this condition about the rank being a given number, that's going to be some, some kind of hypersurface or some, some sort of sub-variety inside the space of, of, Z, of, of, of inside the space of the moduli space for these matrices. And the chance that you land on a hyper, particular hypersurface is always going to be zero if it's lower dimensional. So you, you won't see higher rank if you do this. Um, if you do it this way, I mean, the probability of higher rank will be zero, which, which actually is what is predicted for, I mean, beyond, I mean, beyond these parity things, it is predicted actually that, that the probability, if you choose a random look to curve, the rank is, is as small as possible Give, I mean, I mean, given the parity constraint. So it's, it's predicted that 100% of elliptic curves have rank zero or one asymptotically. But we really want to know about the 0% the that have higher rank. And so to analyze those, we need a more refined model where we don't just take ZP coefficients, but we take Z, we take matrices that are with Z entries and Z entries of a particular size. And so there's actually some chance that you know, some determinant will actually be exactly zero. And so this is what we're gonna do here. So now let, me, let me tell you now the V model for, well, our model at least, for, for how to model the, the rank of a, an elliptic curve. And the, the model is gonna depend on the height of the elliptic curve. So the chance, the chance of having higher rank will depend on, on how big the coefficients of E are. Okay, so so, so here, so we're going to choose, okay, there are going to be some functions that, that are going to go to infinity, but go to infinity at a controlled rate, depending on the height. And we're going to choose, we're going to do n by n matrices for n that's large, but, but whose, law, whose size is, again, controlled by the height of an elliptic curve. And we, we want it to be a, this n to be a random parity. Because it's, that's because we want, we want the parity of the, of the rank of the elliptic curve to be equally distribu distributed. And okay, so so now once you've once you've chosen this n, you choose a random n by n matrix with integer entries, but you also control the size of these integers in, in this matrix. It's an alternate matrix, and the entries of this matrix, the integer entries, are bounded by this this function that's growing at a controlled rate. Okay, so I mean there are only finitely many matrices that satisfy this bound, and you just choose this uniformly at random. And, and if you want to model many elliptic curves, you would just do this independently for each elliptic curve. Okay, so now you have this random matrix, random integer matrix. And now, uh, based on the previous slide, you, you take the co-kernel of that matrix, viewed as a, as a linear transformation from Z to the N to Z to the N. And so that co-kernel will be some finitely generated Bielan group, and you take its torsion. And then that's predicted to be the model for the for the Schaffer-Hirsch Tate group, and on the other hand, if you take the kernel of the matrix, that should be the the model for the rank. So, okay, so these are really random variables. These two things. I mean, I've given them notations to make it look as if they're the like they're they're kind of related to these things. But uh, but these things are defined using just this. They're just these are they're just pure linear algebra constructions. These do not actually have anything to do with the elliptic curve, except that they, well, except that they're, the, the construction depends on the height of the elliptic curve. But this, this really doesn't have anything to do with the, the arithmetic of elliptic curves, except we conjecture that it does, so. Okay, so I'll call this like the, the pseudo Sha of this E, and this is the pseudo rank of this elliptic curve E. And so we predict that these model, these are, the, the distribution of these things is gonna be like the distribution of, of, the, of the actual things that come in, that, the actual things in the arithmetic of, of the elliptic curves. Okay, so that's the model. And the only thing I haven't told you about this model is, is what these, how quickly do these functions grow? Like how, what is it, this controlled rate of growth? Uh, how, how, do I, how, do I, how do I calibrate the model how, by choosing those functions? And, and the way we did that is by 
using some things that we know about the arithmetic of elliptic curves. So it turns out that under standard conjectures, like, like the, the Riemann hypothesis for the L functions of the elliptic curves, things like this, and the birch joint and Dyer conjecture, you can actually figure out what the average size of this group is. And so now you can, you can try to set these parameters so that the average size of this comes out to be the same thing. And it turns out in order to do that, you need, what you need, it turn, it, you, you, can do the, you can do the calculation, it finds out, you find that you need this, this, this exponent, this, this thing to be a, a roughly a, a h to the 1 12th. Okay, so yeah, so that, as I said, this, the, the, so that's, this calibration ensures that, that this model is giving you the right answers for the average size of, of, these, of these two groups, at least as E varies over rank zero curves. Okay, so that's, so once you, now once you have that, okay, so now the model is completely specified. I've told you what these functions, well, I guess I, it doesn't really matter which functions you do that have this combined, it's, it's really only this combination that matters, but yeah, so you choose some growing functions that satisfy this, and that, now you have this well-defined model, and now you can see, okay, what does this model predict? So if, if you define these random variables this way, what, for example, what is the distribution of these numbers? Of these pseudo ranks, and so yeah, so we and that that that's just that's just proving theorems in linear algebra. So that's that's actually something you can do without knowing the hard without answering the hard questions about arithmetic of elliptic curves. And so we did that, and we found that with probability one. So I mean, you know, it must be true because it's it holds with probability one. So so it's a this is a theorem. Also, look, it's a theorem. So there's no. There's not a heuristic, except we're not proving theorems about actual ranks of elliptic curves. We're, we're proving theorems about pseudo ranks, which are really having, yeah, which, so the theorem is that, well, you can count how many elliptic curves have each value of the pseudo rank. So you, if you start with all the elliptic curves, then as I mentioned before, up to, up to, up to height h, you have h to the 5 6 of those. And h to the five, five six is the same as 20 over 24. And, and it turns out that rank zero and one, they, they appear, most of, most of the, the pseudo ranks are equal to zero or one. Most of the time is zero one. So each, each one is like half of h to the five six or some constant, half of whatever the constant is. But then after, it, 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 it becomes, it's zero percent that have higher rank, but you can quantify how much of that, how, I mean, it's asymptotically 0%, but you can quantify how, how quick, how, what the rate of growth is for having, for having pseudo rank at least two. In fact, each time you ask for one higher pseudo rank, the, the fraction of elliptic curves that has that pseudo rank goes down by a factor, by a factor of h to the 124. So you started with h to 20 over 24. If you want pseudo rank at least two, then it's only going to be h to the 19, 19 over 24. Which is zero percent asymptotically compared to all the all the elliptic curves, and then there are even fewer that have pseudo rank at least three, and it keeps going like this. So this is the Wicca theorem, and, and eventually, okay, you get down to something where it's h to the zero, or well, we actually we're not our analysis is not fine enough to figure out like whether this is plus it's like plus or minus here. So this we're not quite sure whether this is h like it could be like log h or something, or it might be like one over log h. Um, we don't, we don't know anyway, but, but then once you go beyond that, then conjecturally it, it should be finite. In fact, we proved that there are only finally many, with probably one, there are only finally many elliptic curves with pseudo rank greater than 21. So, okay, so that's a theorem. That's a, this is a, this is a theorem in linear algebra. And, and then the heuristic is that, so this is the theorem, but then the heuristic is that these pseudo ranks are actually have something to do with actual ranks. So the, the, the heuristic is that, is that whatever happens to these pseudo ranks is the same thing that happens to the actual ranks. So based on this, it's reasonable. It's, it, this suggests that maybe it's true that, that the ranks, yeah, the actual ranks have the same behavior. Or at least, I mean, yeah. And by the way, this implies that the, rank, the pseudo ranks are uniformly bounded because if there are only finally many E that have pseudo rank exceeding 21, you can just look at those finally many E and look at, well, and just take the, the, the maximum of their ranks and that will be, that will be the overall upper bound. 
So that might be a little bit more than 21, but it'll still be, but it'll be a single upper bound. And so, yeah, so I don't know if I actually believe all this. Uh, I mean, we made it quite a few assumptions going along the way. Um, but, but what I do, I mean, what I do believe is that even, even if 21 is not quite the right answer, I mean, that I, I do believe that there should be some uniform upper bound on the rank. Because, I mean, in order for this, for, for the rank to be unbounded, I mean, this heuristic would have to fail in a very strong way. It would have to, I mean, it would have to be not even close, not even close. Um, yeah, so, so I do, so I do believe, yeah, so anyway, so I do believe, I do believe it's bounded. I mean, there are other reasons why this could fail. There might be some, I mean, as, as no Melkies and other people have pointed out, there could be some algebraic families over the curves that for certain somehow causal reasons have, have higher rank than you would expect. So, but even so, I kind of, I, I, I still kind of believe that even if that does happen, I, 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 I don't believe that things are gonna go so wrong that it will make the rank unbounded, but, but yeah. Yeah, and by the way, you can also try to compare these, these, these predictions with reality, I mean, and so, well, what's known? I mean, Elkies found infinitely many elliptic curves of rank at least 19, which, which is getting pretty, I mean, we predict that there should be infinitely many up to rank, well, if you believe this thing, there should be infinitely many of rank 20 and maybe also infinitely many of rank 21. So it's getting kind of dangerously close, but so far, so far our predictions agree with reality. And he also found one elliptic curve of rank at least 28. I mean, but that's also compatible because we don't, we don't say that 21 is the absolute upper bound. We just say that beyond there, there should be only finite many. So, so far, uh, everything looks sort of consistent. Now, as further evidence, you can, look at, you can look at not just the family of all elliptic curves, but you can look at, you can sort of stratify it according to the torsion subgroup. Because, for example, if you look at elliptic curves whose torsion subgroup is Z mod 6Z, then you don't have h to the five six curves anymore. You have a, you have only h to the one six curves up to height h, and so you have fewer you have fewer tries. You have fewer chances to get high rank, and you can do redo the analysis, and we'll and you will get a different a smaller upper bound for the for the critical value beyond which you have finally many exception elliptic curves of higher rank than that, and and then you can compare that with with the reality about what. Um, What's actually what? Yeah. So the the reality of what of what you what what is actually what's the largest known rank, or the the largest known infinite family of, of elliptic curves of this thing of, of this with this subgroup. So, so yeah. So this this nineteen here means that there is an infinite family of elliptic curves um, that has a trivial torsion. There's a, there are infinitely many elliptic curves over Q with trivial trivial torsion subgroup and of rank at least 19. And well, so far it looks good. I mean, the, 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 the reality is, seems to be matching this. Now, I, I, I think, I'm, I'm not actually sure if this, this table is completely up to date. I think maybe no Malkies will talk, talk about this later. There might, some of these numbers might've been improved in the last few years, in the last year or two. But, but I think it's, I think it's, I don't know, maybe it's still true that, um, I think it's still true that there's not quite, there's no, I, well, I think it's still true that they haven't quite contradicted any of these bounds of protect. And not only that, but they look, uh, I mean, it looks, oops, sorry. So it looks, I mean, not only are we getting a bound that looks, that, that it is compatible with reality, but it looks like the bounds are actually close to what, what people have actually been able, the examples that people have been able to discover in each case. Because I mean, not only are these, are the are upper bounds actually the upper bounds for what's known, but they're actually, they seem to go in parallel. So it, it seems like our predictions are, have some, there's some, there's some connect, I mean, there's, it's not completely disconnected with the reality of what people are finding when they actually try to search for these elliptic curves with given torsion subgroup. Oh, hey, Bjorn, there yeah. are a couple of questions in the chat. Um, a few from Ross Patterson and uh, Grant Molnar about the significance of the numbers 21 and 24 and then one from Alice Silverberg about whether you think it's more likely that you, the bounds aren't sharp or that there are infinite families that reach the bounds that haven't been found yet. 
Okay, yeah, I, I see I see all these questions. Yeah. Okay, so let me start with the significance of 21. So, well, okay, it comes from the previous, let's see, sorry. It comes from this, this previous, this previous slide here. Uh, you, it start, you start with h to the 5, 6 being the total number of Lewis curves, and you have h to the 20 over 24. That, 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 that's the total number of Lewis curves, and then, well, I mean, each time you impose one higher rank beyond one, the rank, the, the number goes down by h to the 1 24th, and so you have to do, you have to do 20 steps, and then you're, at, you're, and then you have to do 20 steps starting at 1, so that gives you 21. Now, okay, that just raises the question, why is it h to the 1 24th? So well, where does the 24 come from? And I think it's the, well, I think it's the same 24 that appears in, <laughs> it's in, in a lot of other math, in all, a lot of other math. I mean, the 24 comes from the 12, and it's, I mean, it's related to the fact that the, the delta is a modular form of weight 12 and all that. And I mean, it, so yeah, I guess it, it comes from the, so going back, so let's see. I mean, it goes back to this calculation of the average size of, of the shell using the, um, using the burst to dire conjecture and to, to analyze, analyze this. It has to do with actually, it boils down eventually to the, to the, the size of the real period of an elliptic curve of height h. And you can show that the, the size of the real period is something like h to the minus one, h to the minus one twelfth. And then, and then if you put, plug that into the burst to dire conjecture, and then that has to be compensated by the size of shock in order for the burst to dire conjecture to hold. And so that, that's kind of where it comes from. So it comes from some calculus, calculus, uh, calculus of uh, calculation of just what, what, do you, what do you get when you do the integral of this elliptic integral that computes the real period for when you have an elliptic curve of height h. Right. So yeah, so that's, if that's, that's what it is. Um, so, okay, so, okay, now let's see. So I guess the next question is, um, Maybe from Alice about, yeah. Okay, let me just get, so Brad Brock, Brock pointed out that, yeah, the first step didn't drop. So if I go to this, this thing, it's actually, it actually, you can see it coming out from, you know, I mean, so maybe it's a little bit surprising. It, it, the first step doesn't drop. It, it, so the graph of this, of this exponent, it goes, you know, it goes, down, and then it goes down. <laughs> so that little kink at the beginning is actually there. I mean, as, and the, that's what you also expect from elliptic, from the arithmetic elliptic curve. So that, that's another reason why we sort of, think that there might be something right about this. But then, yeah, then it goes down. And so that's where the 21 comes from. Um, okay, Ross Petters. Okay, I, I think I explained that. So Alice Silverberg's question. Like, what do I think that's more likely? That our bounds aren't sharp? Or that there are infinite families that reach all their bounds, but we haven't found them yet? Um, I don't know. I think... I mean, I, I would. It wouldn't surprise me too much if I go if I go to this page. I mean, there are there are a lot of predictions here, and some of them are actually very close. So I wouldn't surprise me if somebody someday found an example that that violated one of these. So my, maybe maybe you know maybe maybe here maybe there's maybe you can actually prove this by one and find a family. Maybe there is one. Um, so, but yeah, but I think. I think there are already some examples where there are infinitely many, there are infinite families that, yeah, well, I mean, this, there are some of these cases where there are these infinite families that attain the bound. So, um, yeah. So anyway, maybe I should defer this to people who've actually been doing, been doing these searches and, yeah. Okay. Um, if, I, if I may, uh, all, of the, oh. all of the numbers on the right, don't exploit parity. So if you have two numbers that are equal, that means that you'd guess that about half the time, just for parity reason, the, unless it's, for, it's some weird counterexample to uh, equidistribution of parity, mm -hmm. that you actually will get half those five, they're actually sixes, and half the, ah, and half okay. the three, they're actually fours. 
these okay, are not so my, maybe... these are not from my family. They go back about twelve years to Oshkin and so forth. Ah, okay. So okay. So in some sense, maybe we already expect that some of these bounds are going to be exceeded. Mm -hmm. So, um, right. Okay. So I guess that I guess that's what Armand Brumer was also asking about. So, yeah. So okay. Uh, uh, may I just add one thing? Yes. In experiments okay. where one did assume. Uh, one imposed, uh, let's say, one or two or more uh, rational points, then uh, the rank did jump. It was sometimes the imposed one and sometimes one more. That's why, uh, that's what I meant by my question. You know, it's, uh, I'm surprised that the rank two and rank three are not roughly uh, the same distribution, expected distribution. Because half of the rank, if you've imposed to uh, rank two, you will get rank three half the time, is what it seems like. Um, well, I think, I, well, I think the, well, if, if, you, if you first divide by parity, if you first divide your lipid groups by parity, mm -hmm. and you ask for, okay, for the even rank, for the even parity ones, how many of them have rank at least two? Um, it seems that it's, it's, it's easier for that to happen than it is for an odd rank to have, for an odd parity lipid curve to have rank at least three. Now, so at least that's what our, what our model predicts. And I think that's what you people tend to see in practice as well. But I, I think some people, I mean, at least the computations I know of, I think tend to, tend to agree with this, I think. So I, I, so I, do, I think I do believe that at least. Uh, oh yeah, sorry. So I guess um, so. So I guess I'll let me continue going through these. I'm not, I'm not sure if I answered your question, but um, at least that's what I think is happening. And let me look. Okay, let me. Sorry, there are a couple more questions. I'm, I'm, my talk is basically done, by the way. So, but let me. Let me just. So I mean. So, but let me try to answer the rest of these questions. So the bounds are in terms of height. Can we predict the size of the coefficients of the finitely many exceptions? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, the, the model I think would predict that when there are exceptions, then they should tend to have not so large coefficients. So that's maybe a failing of the model, given that there's a curve rank 28 that has big coefficients. So yeah, I don't know what to I don't know what to say about that. They, I mean. Because the because the, the, the prediction the model says that the larger the the, the co coefficients become, the less and less likely it is to be to be an exception to to be to have that high rank. So, um, yeah. So, okay. Naomi Sweeting says, okay, what are the two maximal isotropic subgroups that intersect to cell P? Um, so okay, maybe I'll defer that to later. I mean, it it uh, it it's it's come it comes in the cohomology. It comes. I can I can show you in terms of the the. Uh, I'll show you maybe later. But uh, let me try to. Um, so okay. Oh, and you have, you have a second question about where is the, in the model is the torsion subgroup. So the only way we use the torsion subgroup is to is to look at how many elliptic curves there are of of height up to h. So if I mean, most, if you look at elliptic curves of, of, of with torsion subgroup Zima 3Z, they, they, then the, the coefficient, the A and B, they satisfy some algebraic condition that, and that cuts down the number of elliptic curves up to height H. And so you get this smaller exponent of H. And, and it's, just be, it's just from the fact that you have fewer, fewer elliptic curves to try that you, you have fewer chances to get a high, high rank elliptic curve. And so that, that's the only way in which the torsion subgroup comes in in the model. Okay, so Will Sowen. Uh, I'm just commenting in response to questions that people had asked. I don't have questions. Okay, you're just, you're just answering questions about, yeah, there are two ways to impose rank two, right. You could first, right, you could first take all the elliptic curve to rank two, and then what, what I would predict there is that 100% of them will have rank two, or you, Wait. If you take oh, a specific you're, you're thing, saying something different. Okay, you're saying that if you if you algebraically start with two rational points, then parity will make half of them. 
I think. Rank yeah, three. so if you give a specific family elliptic curves with rank two, then right. there will be this parity phenomenon that half of them have rank three, which is what Armand was right. mentioning. Right. But but I, I, yes, right. So, but in this, in this, for these calculations, that was for the, for the calculation on the previous, on the previous slide, oops, sorry. Um, here I was thinking of just taking all elliptic curves, in which case I do expect that rank three is less likely. Okay. Um, great. So, okay. So let me, end, let me just end with this summary slide just to say what I told you. So, so yeah, so we get, we got to, in order to, to, to estimate what's happening to, with ranks, we bound it, we sort of made a model for this complete package. And, and then you could, you can corroborate it by using theorems about all the different aspects of the package. And, and then the, the model predicts that the pseudo ranks are, are all but finally, all but finally many of the pseudo ranks are bound by 21. So we, we suggest that we believe that the ranks are, are uniformly bounded based on that. Okay, and then there are these things that I, that, that, that I didn't have time to talk about, but uh, that, that you, can, you can try to do similar heuristics for other number fields or, or function fields. And, or you can also try this for abelian varieties. And I think, I think there should be similar theorems for these two, or not theorems, but you, you can, it's re, it, seems, it's there, there, it seems reasonable to predict similar things, at least to guess reasonable things. But I mean, there's, the evidence is maybe more shaky for those, but, uh, but I, still, still, I still believe it. So, okay, all right. Thank you all for, for your, yeah, thank you all. So I enjoyed all, hearing all the questions and everything. So, yeah. Thanks, John. Well, let's see, are there some more questions? Oh, um, and there was Fabian's original question. Oh yeah, so let's see. So let me scroll back in the chat. Okay, so could you point to where the heuristics fail for function fields? Um, uh, well, uh, sort of. Uh, yeah, so, well, let's, let's go here. So there's the next slide. Okay, so, I mean, yeah. I mean, by the way, you should all feel free to leave. I mean, this is, this is like, this is like me cheating to give a longer talk than I'm allowed to give. So, so, or anyway, so let's take a global field, probably maybe as a function field. And you can again, talk about this, this fancy E, except now it's going to be the all rep isomorphism class representatives for elliptic curves over K. And because we want to exclude finally many exceptions, instead of taking the maximum of the ranks, we want to look at sort of the limb soup of the ranks. So, which is, it, it's, the, it's the number above which there are only finitely many elliptic curves of that higher rank. So our heuristic predicts that this, the, this, this limb soup for Q should be either 20 or 21. I, I, I don't know whether it's 20 or 21, because I don't act, for the, in the case of 21, we, the heuristic was not fine enough. It was not fine enough to tell whether they're infinitely many or finitely many at 21. It was like H to the O of one, that could be positive, or the exponent for positive and negative. But so it might be only finally many of rank 21. Um, yeah, so you can run the heuristic. I mean, it works pretty much the same way for, for global field and, and it gives exactly the same, is the same estimate. So, so you, if, you, if you believe that, then you would get that, that the, the, the limb soup should be again, 20 or 21 for every global field. And, and this, is, this is very, uh, this, this does not match well with reality. So, so that's, yeah, so that's maybe an uh, unfortunate thing, but, uh, but I, what I can do is I can tell you, well, here's a reason why you, don't, you shouldn't expect it to, to compare well with reality. Okay, so first of all, here's, here's a way in which it doesn't match reality. First of all, for a global function field case, the actual limb soup is infinity because it, the rank is actually unbounded. And even for number fields, you can find examples of, of special number fields over which you can, so we can prove, actually we prove in this paper that there is a number field, for example, where there are, there are infinitely many elliptic curves of rank, at least a million. So we can actually construct unconditionally a number field that, that has infinitely many elliptic curves of rank over, over, over a million. 
So, so that's another evidence that says that this BK is not going to be 20 or 21. But the, all the constructions of these, okay, okay, here's some specific number of fields that we use for this, this theorem, for these theorems. Um, but to re reconcile this with, with our heuristic, there's these elliptic curves of high rank that, that are, have been constructed in the literature by Shafrevich and Tate and, then, and also by, by Omer and then by us, they're all special in that they, 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 these are elliptic curves that, I mean, they're, nominally they're defined over K, but they actually come from base change from a much smaller field. And so you can, instead of, yeah, so, so maybe, yeah, so maybe, I mean, those elliptic curves that, that, come, that come from a small field, I mean, they're arithmetic, they're arithmetic reasons, they're, they're why they should have higher rank. So, um, so, so, so the way we, we propose to, 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 to correct our heuristic is just, just, just to exclude, not allow the elliptic curves that come from a smaller field. And if you exclude those, then it's conceivable that there is, that there's again, a uniform upper bound. Um, there's no counterexample known to this, to that statement, even for function fields. And so, so that, that's what, that's what maybe I believe. I mean, it's still not true that it's, the 21 is exactly the number because there, there is a special, there are a few special families, like there's this example of Shioda that has, gives you infinitely many of rank, of rank, of rank, at least 68. But yeah, but okay. So, but outside of that special family, it's possible. Yeah. So, but it, even so, it's, it's, it seems reasonable to, to to guess that maybe it's uniformly bounded once you exclude these curves coming from lower, lower, lower fields. Okay. Thank okay. you so much, Bjorn. This was a wonderful talk. And next time we're going to have Noam Elke speak on September 15th. So I hope you can all join for us with us then. Okay. Goodbye. Okay. There's, there's some, there's some more. Oh, there's I don't know if I should keep answering questions, but. Oh yeah, I, definitely. If people can stick around. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the question is, would the generalization to be a blend rise be only for self dual ones? So I guess maybe, I mean, principally polarized maybe. So, um, well, I mean, actually I have a, I have a slide about this. Yes, I, I did come well prepared. So, <laughs> uh, yes. So you can ask, is there, is there a bound on the rank that depends only on, of course you have to, the bound, the bound's gonna have to depend on the dimension. Cause you can just take a elliptic curve of, of rank 28 and just take E cross E cross E cross E and you can make the, uh, the rank big that way. O also you could start with, you could just take one of the variety and just let the number field grow. So the bound is also gonna have to depend on the degree. So, but you could ask, is there a bound that depends only on the degree and the, and the, and the dimension of the abelian variety? And well, I mean, there's no, you don't actually have to restrict to principally polarized ones because you can use Zarkin's trick to reduce to the principally polarized case. And so by doing that, and also by doing restriction of scalars, you can, you can reduce to the family of, of just abelian varieties of a fixed dimension over Q and a principally polarized abelian varieties over Q. And then you can, you can define a height in some naive way again, and um, you can prove that the number of abelian varieties of a given height is, is bounded by some polynomial in H. It's maybe not H to the five six anymore, but it's H to some, some fixed number. And so if you have a, a pseudo rank that, that decays by a factor of H to the sum fraction for each, every time you ask for a one higher rank, then again, you would expect, expect that the pseudo rank should be bounded with probably one. And so, so yeah, so my guess is yes, that this should be true. Yeah. Okay, there's another paper. Okay, so I mean, I was mentioning a paper by Richard Giffon. Yeah, I probably should have mentioned that as well. So yeah, okay. Um, so where does our heuristic to get rank when use that are over Q? So it, it, unfortunately, our heuristic doesn't use Q. The heuristic also predicts rank 21 for other number fields too. So it's a, a, so the Shiota thing is really is really in contradiction with our heuristic. But on the other hand, I guess, I don't know, I can kind of like wave my hands and explain away and saying, oh, it's just a special family. Maybe if you exclude these finally, I mean, there are the, there are the others conjectures, like like these conjectures, money conjectures about points of 
you know, real to the rational point about how you have to like exclude some sub varieties and stuff like that. So maybe maybe you're supposed to do the same thing here. So I, I don't know. So yeah, but you, technically it it does violate our heuristic. So it's, so. So um, along the lines of Menin's conjecture, uh, do you think like so in Menin's conjecture? Doesn't those tell you how many rational points there are, or at least in the modern form, it tells you that they're distributed, how they're distributed piadically for each prime p. Oh. Um, and so, do you have do you have a guess about how like elliptic curves over Q of rank seven are distributed piadically in the moduli space of elliptic curves? Um, well, I, I haven't tried. No, I don't. I don't have a prediction, but I think that. I think that our analysis could be used to get to get that because I mean, it's partly. Well, I mean, let's see. Actually, I'm not sure. I, I'm not, but I mean, partly part of part of the model, at least the calibration part of it, comes from looking at the birch sprinter dire conjecture, and you sort of. So I mean, uh, one one way to think about it is you you take the birch sprinter dire conjecture. And you solve for the you solve for the square root of shot. Yeah. Because square root of shot is supposed to be an integer. And and if you want to if you want to measure the probability, and if if that if the if sort of the rank if the rank seven shot is zero, I mean, that means that your elliptic curve actually has higher rank. If, if you know what I mean by rank zero. Yeah, so if you if you pretend that your elliptic curve is rank seven and you look at the Bertrand dire conjecture for elliptic curve rank seven and then you solve for the square root of Shaw, you get some formula in, involving the seventh derivative of the L series, and and then that formula if it's going to be an integer and if 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 that is zero that means that the L function, the seventh derivative of the L function is actually zero. So that means you actually have higher rank, you have rank eight or higher, and so. You see, so then the question is, you take that square root of shot and you ask, what's the chance that it's exactly zero? And you can estimate that based on what the range in which the square root of shot is, where it lies. And that, that, that you, can, you, can, you can use that as sort of a guess as to how often it is that your rank, your family, your rank seven elliptic curves actually have higher rank. And, but that, that, and that probably will change, I mean, that range in which it lies will change depending on things like the, the Tamagawa factors at P, which are going to depend on your, where, your elliptic curve, how it looks periodically. And so you could, you could, you could incorporate that into these, into these heuristics, I think. And you, maybe you could use that to, to get some kind of idea, answer to a question. But I don't, I, I don't, as far as I know, nobody's tried that. But maybe, maybe you could do that. I mean, even for rank two, I think it'd be interesting to do that. I mean, it's definitely true, I think. I, I mean, so that if you impose PI conditions on your elliptic curves, you can make it more likely to have higher rank. In fact, that was Mester's idea back in the 80s for finding higher rank elliptic curves. He, took, he chose elliptic curves that had the maximum number of points mod two, the maximum number of points mod three, and the maximum number of points mod five. And then just by imposing these conditions, it turned out by searching within those families, it already made it very likely to have high rank elliptic curves. So that, so, and so what he's doing effect, effectively is he's, he's like, he's pushing, he's like putting his hand on one side of the scale of the Birch and Cerner Dyer scale and like making it more like making, push, pushing it to make it more likely that the Shah, the square root of Shah is going to vanish. The square root of whatever rank Shah is going to vanish. <laughs> 